Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan lil'alameen. Nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So we'll be continuing our commentary to Imam Bukhari's work on Islamic etiquette, which is entitled Al-Adab al-Mufrad, or a standalone work on morals and manners. And we've reached hadith number 86. And hadith number 86 falls under the chapter where Imam Bukhari says, Babu Haml sabi al al The chapter dealing with carrying a child on one's shoulders. And just as a reminder, all these chapters we're covering now are dealing with the rights of children and the way in which parents should be bringing up children and the inter- engagement and the interactions that the parents should be having or the adults should be having with those children. So carrying a child upon the shoulder. So he quotes the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu. قَالَ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولُ رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ وَالْحَسَنُ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ عَلَىٰ آتِكِهِ وَهُوْ يَقُولُ أَلَّهُمَ إِنِّي أُحِبُّهُ فَأَحِبَّهُ That Bara ibn Azib, he says, I saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Al-Hassan was with him عليه السلام and he was on his shoulder. So he was carrying Al-Hassan on his shoulder. And while he was doing so, he was saying, Allahumma inni uhibbuhu. Oh Allah, I love him. Fa'ahibbahu, so love him as well. Oh Allah, I love him, so love him as well. So this is an example of how adults should be t- uh, treating children, dealing with children. So the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, despite being a prophet of Allah, despite being an adult, he was playing with Al-Hassan. And he would play with Al-Hassan al Hussein, And he was carrying Al-Hassan on his back. And not just that, but he was saying openly, Allahumma inni uhibbu, I love him. And just imagine a, a, a child growing up in an environment like this. Look at the positive reinforcement that's been given to a child by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sort of love that he, that child is feeling and that love that's openly being displayed to that child. How will that child be brought up or how will that child feel in that environment? And this is a lesson for all of us, especially as parents, that we should be showing our affection and our love for our children openly. And it's very difficult, especially for Asians, it's very difficult for us to display emotions right? and, it's, and to say these sort of things. But we need to go against our nature right? and try to show openly and clearly, tell our children that we love them, show that the affection that we have for our children. And then you'll see the difference in those children when they're growing, when they're growing up. That environment of love and safety and uh, that web that you can, uh, of protection you can put around them it will actually affect them positively. So, the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu is saying, I love him, al Hassan," And then he says, فَأَحِبَّهُ And love him as well. And love him as well. So we as believers, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves al Hassan, And we as believers are also required to have love for the grandsons of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, al Hassan al Hussein. And in fact, uh, we are required to have love for all of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Part and parcel of our Iman is to love and to honor and respect the family of our Messenger ﷺ. And the family of our Prophet ﷺ includes his wives. It includes his children. It includes his grandchildren. And also includes a Banu, uh, Banu Hashim and a Banu Abdul Muttalib, these two tribes in which the Messenger of Allah was born. Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. This, this is the family, and the descendants of these people are the family of the Messenger. And we are required to love and respect and honor the family of the Prophet. In one hadith, the Messenger said, uh, it's the hadith of uh, where the messenger stood up at a watering place called Al Khum. And in this place, he praised and he glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gave a reminder, a lecture to the Sahaba. And then he said, O oh people, I am only human. And soon the messenger of my Lord will come to me, meaning the angel of death. And I will respond, meaning I will, go, I will pass away. I'm leaving amongst you two weighty things, two heavy things. 
The first of which is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which is guidance and light. And then follow the book of Allah and hold fast to it. And then he spoke about the Quran a bit. And then he said, I'm also leaving amongst you the people of my family, my household, my Ahlul Bayt. And I remind you of Allah with regards to the people of my household. household. I warn you, or I, 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 I enjoin you to fear Allah when it comes to my family. I enjoin you to fear Allah when it comes to my family. I enjoin you to fear Allah when it comes to my family. Three times. So here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa repeatedly is telling us to show the respect and the honour that's due to the family of our Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And likewise, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he would say, pay attention to the household of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Pay attention to the household of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa meaning give them their due, give them their rights. And from amongst the household is of course al Hassan and al Hussein, the grandsons of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And it's part and parcel of us to love them, a part and parcel of our iman, and part and parcel of our following of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, to love al Hassan and al Hussein, but not to go to the extremes, but not to go to an extreme. Not to go to the extremes that the Shia do, for example. Rather, all of our love is to be tempered by moderation, tempered by the Sharia. What the Sharia allows we do, or what the Sharia enjoins we do, what the Sharia prohibits us from doing, we also prohibit, we are prohibited from doing. So we don't start giving divine qualities to Al-Hassan and Hussein. We don't start giving them supernatural, superhuman qualities. They were human beings, they were grandsons of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and we love them as being grandsons of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, and we love them because they were righteous servants of Allah, whom Allah loved as well. So, oh Allah, I love him, so love him as well. And this is an example of the gentleness and the mercy and the kindness of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa By his nature, he was Nabi al-Rahmah, he was a prophet of mercy. He was a prophet of gentleness. By his nature, he was gentle and merciful and kind. And we see this being displayed in all walks of life when it comes to our Messenger alayhi wa In all areas of life, we see this gentleness and kindness and mercy shining forth. And this is an example of this. The mercy and gentleness he showed to his grand- grandchildren. And also, this hadith, it tells us, or gives us another lesson. And that lesson is that we should be making du'a for our children. Adults and parents should be making du'a for our children. Oh Allah, I love him, so love him as well. This is a du'a for the children. We as parents should not be making du'a against our children. We should not be cursing our children. We should not be, you know, uh, wishing harm upon our children, making du'a for harm upon our children. Our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us that the du'a of the parent against the child is answered. The du'a of a parent against a child is answered. And imagine if a parent was to make a du'a in anger against his child and that du'a gets answered. And that thing that you ask for actually happens to the child. How would the parent feel? We shouldn't allow our emotions to get away, run away with us. We shouldn't be making du'a against our children. Likewise, the Messenger of Allah taught us that the du'a for the child is also answered as well. The du'a of the parent for the child is also answered. So we should be trying to, trying to do our best to make du'a for our children, even when they upset us, even when they annoy us, even when they anger us, the du'a we should be trying to make is one for their children, not against our children. There are many, many virtues of Hassan and Hussein. And we're not going to go through all of them, but from amongst them is the fact that the Messenger of Allah loved them and Allah loves them as well. From amongst the virtues of Al Hassan and Al Hussein is that they are the leaders of the youth in Jannah. Our Messenger Islam taught us. That they are the leaders of a youth in Jannah. So in Jannah, out of all the youth, their leaders are Al Hassan and Hussein. And the leaders of men in Jannah are who? Who knows? Who are the heads of, 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 of the male part of human race in, in Jannah? No. Amongst Yumba Muhammad Amongst that Ummah, who are they? Yeah, Abu Bakr and Umar. It's pretty obvious, right? Abu Bakr and Umar. When it comes to the women, they also have four women who are amongst the best of women, and they also are from amongst the leaders of the women of Jannah. Who are they? Khadija. Uh, Amina, yeah. The wife of Fir'aun. Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Not Amina. No. Khadija. Asiya. Maryam. Fatima. Khadija, Fatima, Maryam, and Asiya. These are the best of women the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu said. 
and they're also from the leaders of the women in paradise. So, Al Bara ibn Azib he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he had Al Hasan on his shoulders, and he was playing with him, and he's making a dua, Allahumma inni uhibbuhu fa ahibbahu. Oh Allah, I love him, love him as well. And then the next chapter, Imam Bukhari brings Bab al Waladu Qurratul Ain. That the child is a source for the coolness of the eye. Or a child is a source of joy. A child is a source of joy. He brings coolness to the eye. And in this, he brings a very interesting hadith. It's a lengthy hadith. And I'm just, I'm just going to quote it in English because, because of the length. So, Jubair ibn Nufair. He says that one day we were sitting with Al Miqdad ibn al Aswad. Al Miqdad is a companion of the Messenger. And this is, of course, after the Prophet has passed away. So, we were sitting with Al Miqdad. And while we were doing so, a man passed by us. And this man is a Tabi'i. He's a, he's a Tabi'i. He's from a second generation of Muslims. He has not lived to see the time of the Prophet. He, he was born afterwards, or he believed afterwards, after his passing away. And so as he's passing by Al-Miqdad, who's a companion, he said, Blessing be to these two eyes which saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Blessing be to these two eyes which saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, uh, this statement of his, it shows us two things. It shows, of course, the love that the Tabi'een had for the companions and the respect that they had for them because of the fact that they saw the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. And also it shows a desire that the, the believers have of seeing the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. And all believers have this desire, we all have it, it's a good desire to have, we want, we want to see, we would love to have seen and lived with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or have at least seen his face and lived with him. So he says, um, blessing be to these two eyes that have seen the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, By Allah, I wish that I had seen what you had seen and witnessed what you had witnessed. I wish that I had seen what you had seen and witnessed what you had witnessed. And then the narrator says, I was really surprised. I was really surprised at the reaction of Al-Miqdad because Al-Miqdad got angry. He got upset. And he's surprised because this man has said nothing but good. Yeah, this is a desire of every believer. I wish I've seen a messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. And, you know, uh, I wish I'd seen what you had witnessed. I'd seen what you had seen and witnessed what you had witnessed. It's a common sentiment that we have. But the companion gets angry at this. And, and the narrator says, I was really surprised at this. Why did he get angry? And then he, the al-Miqdad, he turns to this tabi'i. And he says, what makes a person desire the presence of something that Allah has made absent? What makes a person desire the presence of something that Allah has made absent? So here the Al-Miqdad, he wants good for the Tabi'i. He wants good for this, for this person. And he sees that this person has made a mistake. He thinks he's made a mistake. He believes he's made a mistake. And he's correcting that mistake. And this is the way of the scholars. That if they see a mistake, they correct that mistake. And he's making a statement that shows his depth of understanding. And what he's saying is, why are you questioning Allah's witness, wisdom? Allah chose you for a certain time. And Allah chose us for a certain time. And there's a wisdom in Allah choosing us. And there's a wisdom in Allah choosing you for, this, for, for that time. And there's a wisdom in Allah choosing you for that time. And there's a wisdom in Allah choosing us for this time. Why are, we question, why are you questioning the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He has no idea what his situation would be had he lived at the time of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah chose the companions for a reason. Allah selected the companions to be companions of the Messenger of Allah for a reason. And al miqdad is saying, how do you know that you would have been able to react positively at the time of the Prophet had you faced what the companions of Allah had faced? Had you faced the difficulties and the tribulations and the trials that the companions went through? How do you know you would have reacted in a positive way? How do you know you would, how are you certain that you could have done this? By Allah... There were certain people who saw the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and looked at his face, but Allah threw them on their faces in hellfire. Yet Allah threw them in, on their faces in hellfire. Because they neither answered him nor believed in him. They saw his face, yet still Allah threw them in hellfire. Because they did not respond to his call, nor did they 
uh, believe in him. Do you not instead, he says, praise? Why are you instead praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why aren't you instead praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because he brought you forth at a time when all you know is your Lord. You never lived at another time. You lived in a time when you, in your entire life you knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, all you know is your Lord. And you believe in what your Prophet has brought. Why are you just praising Allah for this? This is the greatest gift possible that Allah has given you. That you have lived a life of Iman. You have lived a life believing in Allah. You have lived a life believing in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he goes on to say, Others have spared you the tribulations. Others, meaning the companions, have spared you having to go through the trials and tribulations uh, that we faced. By Allah, the Messenger of Allah was sent in the harshest state in which any Prophet was sent. After a gap in the Prophets and at a time of ignorance. These people he was sent to believed there was no deen, no religion better than worshipping idols. And he brought the Furqan, he brought a criterion by which it was possible to, to, learn, to learn about the truth and falsehood. And this criterion, this Furqan he brought, it led to rifts between father and child. It split families up. Father fought child, child fought father, blood fought, fought blood. It got to the state that a man would see his father or his child or his brother as a kafir, as a disbeliever, believing him to be in hellfire. And this is of course something that's very upsetting, very hurtful, very difficult for a person to bear when he sees his father or his child or his brother or his family disbelieving in the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, knowing that as a result of that disbelief, that person will go to hellfire. While he himself, Allah had given him, opened his heart to faith. He knew that the other person would be destroyed in the fire. And therefore he knew that he would lose the coolness of his eye. And this is why Imam Bukhari brings this, this hadith here. He would lose the coolness of his eye. He would lose the, the coolness of his eye brought about by his father, or his brother, or his child. Because he knows that the one he loves will be in the fire. Because he knows that the one he loves will be in the fire. And then al miqdal quoted the ayah of the Qur'an وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ That those who say Our Lord gifts us, gift us with wives or partners and children who will be the joy of our eyes who will be the coolness of our eyes. So here al miqdal he is saying to this tabi'i don't question the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows best. Don't spend a life asking what if, why, why, or when, what if this had happened, why didn't this happen to me. Don't live a, this sort of life. Rather live a life where you do your best but you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You trust in the wisdom of Allah. You have absolute uh, certainty that Allah is all wise and that what he chose for us is best for you. Don't live a life of ifs and buts. This is what al miqdad is saying to uh, uh, this tabi, despite what he was saying was good. But what he was saying implied that he was questioning the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has chosen this for you. And in this respect, when al miqdad is saying, why aren't you instead praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In this respect, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, in a beautiful hadith actually, he said, I wish I could meet my brothers. I wish I could meet my brothers. So the companion says, are we not your brothers? The companions around him, they asked the question, are we not your brothers? And he replied, no, you are my companions. You are ashabi, you are my companions. My brothers are those who will come after me, who will believe in me without having seen me. My brothers are those who will come after me, who believe in me without having seen me. So Allah chose the companions to be the companions. Allah chose the tabi'in to be the tabi'in. Allah chose us to be Muslim living in the time that we're living in now as part of the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there's a wisdom in all of this and in all of this there's goodness for us and, and it's the best for us and this ayah that Al-Miqdad quotes وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةُ عَيُّنْ that grant us in our wives and our children our partners, our husbands and our wives and our children those who will be the joy of our eyes this again is a du'a that we should be making. We are making the Muslim as one who makes du'a for his, for his brothers and sisters in Islam. We are not people who curse. We are not people who uh, make du'a against people. 
we try to make as much as possible dua for, for the people, for the Muslims, for our families. And the meaning of this supplication, make our, our Lord give us joy in our wives and children, is to give us wives and children and husbands who live with each other with, in love and compassion, who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who don't commit shirk. And in commentary to this ayah, many of the companions said that what this ayah means is that there is nothing more joyful and more pleasing to a believer than a righteous partner or a righteous child or a righteous brother or friend. Meaning someone who obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the believer, for parents, for the Muslim, this is the goal. This is, the, this is what we want from our children. And when we see this in our children and our brothers and our parents and our wives and our husbands, that they are people who are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are people who are staying away from shirk. This fact alone gives us joy. We want good. Uh, a true believer loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And this is part and parcel of that. We want our brothers to be people who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who don't commit shirk or live their lives in tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So grant us our husbands and our wives and children who are joyful, who give us joy. Meaning who are righteous who serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we as Muslims, this ayah shows us we as Muslims, we want good for the people around us. We want good for the believers around us as well. And the greatest good possible that we want is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we see that in the believers, genuinely it should give us happiness. It should make us happy when you see this in the brothers and sisters around us. When we see a practicing brother, when we see a practicing sister, when we have a practicing husband and a practicing wife, we should be happy. And it should be a genuine happiness. Did you have your hand up? Uh, the ayah is Surah Al-Furqan, uh, chapter, Surah 25, chapter 70, ayah 74. And then the last... Or second to last, perhaps the last hadith we'll talk about. Bab man da'a li sahibihi an akthir ma lahu wa waladahu. Chapter. The one who makes dua that his companion have lots of money and lots of children. Or have lots of wealth and lots of children. And in this chapter, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah alayhi, he quotes the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, who was of course a servant of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he said, one day, I entered upon the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and there was myself and my mother and my aunt, Umm Haram, with him. And when he came to us, he asked us, should I pray with you? And it was not the time of an obligatory prayer. Meaning he's asking, shall I pray an optional prayer with, with you? So, so this is part and parcel of the guidance of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. That, you know, whenever he was with a group of people, or often when he was with a group of people, he would, off, he would pray with them, nafil prayers, uh, sunnah prayers, to show them, to give them the barakah of the prayer, and to show them that we should be praying as much as possible whenever possible. So, should I pray with you? And this was not a time of obligatory prayer. And then one of the people who was listening to this hadith from Anas bin Ibn Malik, he says, uh, uh, where did he put Anas in relation to him? In the prayer that he prayed, where, in which, what position did Anas take? And this shows us that the people who are listening, they want, they want to know everything. When it comes to the prayer, they want to know everything, all the details. They have this eagerness to learn. So they want to know, in this congregational prayer that the Messenger of Allah led you in, where did everybody stand? What was the position of each person? So we can know how people stand. And so the reply was, he put him on his right side. He put him on his right side. And then Anas continues. Then he made, he, he prayed with us. And then he made dua for us. The people of the house. And the dua that he made for us, again the same message, we're making dua for people. The dua that he made for us, that he gave, that we would have the best of the blessings of this world and the next. That we would have the best of the blessings of this world 
and the next. Or we would have the best of this world in the next. And then my mother, who's obviously present, and this is saying, my mother said, Messenger of Allah, make dua for your little servant. Make dua for your little servant. And it's a term of endearment. Make, make dua for your little servant. The little servant, of course, is Anas, who is the son of the mother. And this again shows the, the mercy that the mother has for her child. And the love that a mother has for her child. And the desire that a mother naturally has for her child for goodness. That here we have, imagine a situation, we have the messenger of Allah making dua for her. Right. And asking for dua for the best of, uh, for the best of this life and the next. He's making dua for her. And, while, and, and what is the mother thinking? She's, the mother is, instead of saying, make more, thinking more, make more and more dua for me, what does she do? She says, make dua for them. She directs the messenger of Allah to stop making dua for her and instead to make dua for her son. And this shows again the love and the honor, uh, the love that a mother has for her child and a desire for goodness. So here, the mother is giving preference to her child over herself when it comes to something as important and as valuable as the dua of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she says, make dua for my little servant, for your little servant, meaning my son. And he asked Allah to grant me every blessing. And at the end of his dua, he said, Oh Allah, grant him a lot of wealth and many children and bless him. Oh Allah, grant him a lot of wealth and many children and bless him. And this dua is from the miracles of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that, he, that this dua became true. That Anas became very wealthy. And he had, in some narrations, mentioned that overall he had more than 100 children. More than 100 children. Right? And many of them passed away before he passed away. He lived a long life as well. And one of the things that this hadith shows us, aside from making dua again for, for the believers, is that there's nothing wrong with having wealth. And there's nothing wrong of, of, for asking or nothing wrong in asking of Allah or asking Allah for wealth in this life. There's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. But what's wrong is to be distracted by this wealth. What's long, wrong is to live uh, for this wealth. What's wrong is to ignore Allah and the hereafter as a result of this wealth. And what's wrong is not to want blessings in that wealth. Which is why in this dua, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he made dua for wealth and blessings. He made dua for wealth and blessings, both together. So he wanted Anas to have wealth, but he wanted that wealth to be blessed by Allah, to have, have barakah as well. He wanted that wealth to have barakah as well. So wealth and children are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what this hadith shows us. Wealth and children are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, should, this hadith also shows us that this religion is a religion of balance. As I said, there's nothing wrong in asking for wealth. There's nothing wrong in asking for children and wanting lots of children. There's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. But we understand, because we understand, and Islam understands that we live in this world. And we have to live our lives in this world as well. And there's nothing wrong with living a comfortable life either in this world. We're not hermits. We're not like extreme Christians that go and live, abandon the society and live as, as hermits. We're not all monks. And we're not people who are people of lusts and desires, hedonists, living just for this world. Islam is a religion of balance. Nothing wrong with having wealth, nothing wrong with having children, but don't let that distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final hadith, and this is an amazing hadith actually, for us to consider. Bab al-walidatu rahimat. Bab al-walidatu rahimat. Chapter, mothers are merciful to their children. Mothers are merciful to their children. And again, this is a narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. جاءت امرأة إلى عائشة رضي الله عنها فأعطتها عائشة ثلاثة مرات That a woman came to Aisha رضي الله عنها And in some narrations it mentions that Aisha went looking around her house She came asking, begging basically And she had two of her children with her And Aisha looks around her house looking for something to give to this person and she finds nothing except for three dates. She finds nothing except for three dates. So she gives these three dates to, uh, to this woman. And this shows us 
Again, it's an example of the condition in which the Messenger of Allah lived. This is a house. She's in the house of the Messenger of Allah. And in this house, which is a very small house anyway, Aisha is searching and she finds nothing at all except for three days. This is how the Messenger of Allah lived. A very simple life. And this is also a virtue for Aisha because this is how she lived as well. A very simple life. And more than that, the scholars mentioned that this hadith shows another virtue of Aisha. And that is her patience. Because she didn't complain about the circumstances in which she was living in. All she can find is three days. That's it. Months would go by in the house of the Messenger of Allah without a fire being lit. Without hot food being served. And she's living in this situation but she never once complains to the Messenger of Allah. She was, her imam did not allow her to complain. She was a wife of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa she was somebody of patience. And she was also one of the virtues we see of Aisha in this, in this hadith. Very generous. All she finds is three dates. That's all she has in her house. She's obviously going to go hungry. The Messenger of Allah is going to go hungry as well. Her husband is going to go hungry. But she prefers giving the dates to these people who have come give, to, to begging. And again, an, uh, another point of benefit for us here is that scholars point out from hadith like this that if people come to us for begging and we believe they're genuine, we should give them something. Even if it's small, even if it's just a pound coin, even if it's 50p, it doesn't matter, just give them something. When people come begging, give them something. And don't, turn, don't, don't let them leave empty-handed. Genuine, yeah. If we believe that they're taking the make whatever some people do, then inshallah, inshallah that's an excuse not to do so. So she gives this, these dates uh, Three dates to this woman. فَأَعْطَتْ كُلَّ سَبِيٍ لَهَا تَمْرَةً So she gives one date to, the mother gives one date to each of her children. And then she kept for, وَأَمْسَكَتْ لِنَفْسِهَا تَمْرَةً And then she keeps one date for herself. And then the, her children, both her children, eat the dates. And then they start looking at the date in the hand of the mother. And so she breaks the date in two. And gives half a date to each of her children. So she gives half a date to each of her children. And uh, in this, uh, another lesson is that we see a mother being just to her children. She's giving an equal amount to each of her child. And this is something that child, that the Sunnah of the Messenger, the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, strongly recommended for the for the parents to always be fair and equitable and just with their children. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, treat your children equally when giving gifts. If you want to give gifts to your children, be fair to them, give, treat them equally. And if I was to prefer one child over another when giving gifts, in giving gifts, I would, I would give preference to the daughters. I would give preference to the women. But if I was to prefer one child to another when it comes to giving gifts, then I would prefer the daughter over the, over the son. But be equal when you're giving gifts. And likewise, at one time, a man was sitting with a messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and his son came to him. Aye, that man's son came to him. And he kissed him and made him sit and picked him up and put him on his lap. And then his daughter came running as well. And the man made the daughter sit on his right hand side. And when a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasalam, saw this, he said to this man, You have not treated your children equally. You have not treated your children fairly. Meaning you kissed your son, you made him sit in his lap. Your daughter, you didn't kiss her, and you made her sit on her right hand side. You have not treated your children fairly. So, she gives an equal amount to her dates and goes hungry herself. And this is why Imam Bukhari quotes this hadith here. That the mothers are merciful. She's hungry, but she sees her children looking at a single date left in her hand. She breaks it in two and gives it to her children. And then she leaves. And then the Prophet later on comes, in, comes, to, comes to Aisha and uh, comes home, effectively. And Aisha tells him what she has seen. And she's, of course, surprised. You know, she's, you know, she's you know, you know, praising this woman. And so the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, وَمَا يُعْجِبُكَ وَمَا يُعْجِبُكِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Are you surprised at that? لَقَدْ رَحِمَهَ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهَا سَبِيَيْهَا that Allah has shown her mercy because of the mercy she showed her children. That Allah has shown her mercy because of the mercy that she showed her children.
And this is an example for us of the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahman Irham man fil ard yarham ka man fil sama That those who are merciful, Allah will show mercy to them. Allah will show mercy to those who are merciful. Be merciful to those on earth and Allah will be mercy to you from above the heavens. Be merciful to those who are on earth and Allah will be merciful to you from above the heavens. So this woman is merciful to her children and so Allah, the Messenger of Allah said Allah is showing her mercy because of her mercy to her children. Allah will show her mercy because of her mercy to her children. And one time the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talking about the mercy that Allah shows because of the mercy that a mother shows her child. That during the time of the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, some prisoners were brought to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And there's a woman amongst these prisoners and she's desperately running from one prisoner to another, from one place to another, looking, looking for a baby, for a child. She can't find a child. So she's in a panic, literally in a panic, running from place to place looking for a child. And then when she finds a child, she embraces that child and, stick, uh, and holds, her, holds him fast to her chest. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do you think that this woman could throw her child into the fire? Do you think that this woman can throw her child into the fire? They said, by Allah, we can't imagine this at all. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah is more merciful to his slave than this woman is to her child. Allah is more merciful to his slaves, to his servants, to us, than this woman is to her child. So the mercy that Allah shows us is far greater than any human mercy we can imagine. The mercy that the mother had to the child in giving her dates, the mercy that this mother has towards that child that she finds after thinking that he's lost, that mercy we can't imagine. But the mercy of Allah is beyond this for, for, for mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Lord of mercy. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a Prophet of mercy. This religion is a religion of mercy. The very nature of the guidance that Allah has sent us is one of mercy. From beginning to end, it is mercy. The laws, the rules and regulations, the commands of Allah, the prohibitions of Allah are all based upon mercy and wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point that we find that Allah's Messenger cursed those who were unmerciful or not merciful to animals. Even to the point of animals. If you're cruel to animals, if you don't treat them correctly, we find Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa cursing those individuals. So one time the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saw a donkey and he was branded on his face, on his snout. And of course this is very painful to imagine for, a don- for an animal to be branded on his face. And so the Messenger of Allah said, may Allah curse the one who branded it in this way. Who caused it torture and harm and pain in this way. Likewise, the Messenger of Allah taught us about a woman, a prostitute, who entered, fa- who entered paradise. Why? Because she gave water to a dog, to a dog to, who was thirsty. And a dog is not a, you know, a noble animal in Islam. But despite this, a prostitute is granted entry to paradise because she gave water to a dog that was thirsty. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, said that if you kill even a sparrow for sport, a sparrow for sport, and how often do people, especially in the Middle East or Pakistan or India or whatever, go out and just for sport kill, out, kill birds? Whoever kills a sparrow just for sport, it will cry on the day of rising, it will come on the day of rising and say, my Lord, this person killed me for no reason. My Lord, this person killed me for no purpose. We are only allowed to kill animals if they're uh, causing a nuisance or for food, not for sport. And once while on a journey, the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, they found a bird's nest and they stole the eggs from the bird's nest. And straight after this, they saw the, the mother coming and he was making a, a wailing sound and was beating its wings. And so the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, said, Who has hurt the feelings of this bird? Who has hurt the feelings of this bird? Return her eggs to her. Return her children to her. So we find in every aspect of this religion, every aspect, mercy is there. Mercy is there in every aspect. It's a thread that's common throughout this religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just as a reminder of this beautiful hadith, that a woman came to Aisha begging. And so Aisha gave her three dates. She gave each of her two children a date and kept one date for herself. And the children ate the two dates and then started looking at a single date with the mother. And so she took her date and split it in two and gave each child half of it. And the Prophet later came home and Aisha told him what had happened. And so he said to her, are you surprised at that? 
Allah will show her mercy because of her mercy towards her children. Allah will show her mercy because of her mercy towards her children. And inshallah we'll stop there for today. Subhanahu wa bihamdulillah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.